Well, God so loved the world. We all know the verse, John 3.16. It's one of the first verses that we memorized or learned. Uh, Probably most of us learned it as little kids. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a very simple plan. We needed saved. God sent Jesus to do that. And he sent Jesus for the entire world. So John gives us the concise story. He gives us the plan in just an elevator speech way. Paul in Romans 9, 10, and 11 is really expanding that plan. What does it mean that God so loved the world? And how is it that he's going to get the message of Jesus to anyone so that they can respond and be saved. And so Paul really gives the detail. And it's a pretty dense plan. As scholars and theologians have worked through Romans 9, 10, and 11, most of them come to the end of it and they scratch their heads and say, I'm not really sure exactly what Paul is trying to communicate here. You have the Reformed theologians who just look at these chapters as really a pond to catch fish, predestined fish. They're looking at this as a grounds to support their theological bent. That some were predestined for salvation, others were predestined for damnation. So this is fertile ground for that type of theology. Others have looked at it and said, no, no, and they've tried to come up with a theology in response to the reform theology. And I think Paul doesn't think about either one of those sides. He just uh, gives us a direction moving forward, an explanation of John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Well, let's look in and see how exactly he does that. So what I'm going to do, first of all, we're just going to read this entire chapter. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 11 and just follow along as I read through uh, this entire chapter. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left. And they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see, and ears that could not hear, to this very day. And David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and their backs be bent forever. Again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world, And their loss means 
riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut off or cut out of an olive tree, these pages, right? If you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated, cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Now, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now as far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedience to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So we all clear? Know exactly what this is teaching us? It's interesting, isn't it? Like you said, you come to the end of it, you scratch your head and say, huh? What in the world are you talking about? But as we've seen in the previous two chapters, 9 and 10, the context is Jew and Gentile. Sometimes we read through these pages and we think of individuals. Uh, we think of a, a single person, that this is applying to a single person. But I think if we will keep in mind that this is about Jew and Gentile, the pieces of these passages will start 
falling into place. We'll start getting the big picture. So he asked the question right at the beginning, did God reject his people? Now he specifically means here the Jews, Israel. Did God reject Israel? That's the question. And so Paul is building a case. And again, this case is all about kind of unpacking John 3.16, giving us the detail on how God's plan really does reach out to the entire world. So I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. So what do we know about Israel? Just from this very first verse, that they have not been rejected or cast away. So they have not. And Paul gives himself as an example. I am, am an Israelite, myself a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. And he gives the example of Elijah. Here was old Elijah. Lord, I'm the only one. Everybody else has bowed the knee to Baal. Everybody else has gone the wrong way. I am here all by my lonesome. Maybe some of you have felt that way. Um, You've come to understand the grace of God and you've gone to various churches and it seems like what you know to be true You're not hearing being taught from the pulpit or from Sunday school classes and you just feel like you're the only one. Is that the case? May feel like it, but it's not true. There are people who know the grace of God, people who are living the grace of God, people who are experiencing the grace of God, and people who are sharing the grace of God. There are voices out there communicating the fullness of God's grace and God has been actively involved in that. And so he gives this example of Elijah and says, Elijah, there are 7,000 others that have not bowed the knee to Baal. Open your eyes, you'll see them. In the same way, there is a remnant from the people of Israel who have been chosen by grace, who belong, truly belong to the people of God. These were the folks who weren't pursuing righteousness through the law. As we learned last week, Israel did not understand the righteousness of God, so they tried to establish their own righteousness. That righteousness was through the law, the works of the law. That's what was going to make them set apart. Well, that was never the plan of God. If they had looked to Abraham, they would have known that. Because Abraham believed God concerning his promise of the Messiah. And when Abraham believed God regarding Jesus, it says it was credited to him as righteousness. So if the people of Israel had simply looked at Abraham, they would have understood the plan of God. It was was never through works, it was always by faith. So there is a group of people out of Israel that understood that. And they were chosen by grace. So there's this remnant that exist, this remnant exists today of the people of Israel that have been chosen by grace. I think that's a significant phrase, chosen by grace. God rejects the proud but gives grace to the humble. The proud says in his heart, righteousness is through works of the law. The humble says in his heart, I'm doomed. If God doesn't save me, I can't be saved. So there was this remnant chosen by grace. 
So what then, what the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. What did they seek? The righteousness of God. They didn't obtain it. Why? Because they sought it through the law. It said the elect among them did, this remnant chosen by grace, they did obtain what they were looking for, righteousness. Why? Because they responded to Christ by faith. Now, the others were hardened. That seems harsh, doesn't it? A couple of things about this word hardened. Um, the verb tense is an aorist indicative passive. So their hardening came as a result of their rejection of Christ. And it's interesting with this particular verb tense, the aorist indicative expresses action that is not continuous. Got that? It expresses action that is not continuous. I took a drink of coffee. It's not a continuous action. I've set it down. This hardening was not a continuous action. And just in the very tense of the verb, you get a clue as to God's heart and some of the other things that we're going to look at as we move further along into this, into this chapter. So remember that, that this is an action that is not continuous. And it results from a rejection of Christ Jesus and why they rejected Christ is because they had plan B concerning righteousness. We're going to gain righteousness through works of the law. So God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see, ears that could not hear to this very day. But in verse 11, it says, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? That's what this aorist indicative tense is talking about. It expresses an action that is not continuous. They haven't fallen beyond recovery. And that word, stumble and to fall, falling into something. And what they were falling into was the sin of unbelief. Now, did Abraham fall into the sin of unbelief? No, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Guess who else believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness? Isaac. And guess who followed in his footsteps? Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. All believed God, and to each and every one it was credited to them as righteousness. So Israel, if they would just look back at their history, they would see that righteousness is by faith, and by faith alone. So God is saying they haven't fallen into un unbelief to such an extent that they cannot be rescued, that recovery can't happen. Isn't that good news? I look at that on an individual basis. And I think we all can and say, you know, we get into stuff. And some of the stuff can be really bad, but we never get into it to where we're beyond being rescued. We are beyond recovery. This week, the sports world lost a very endearing character, Pat Summerall. Probably the best football announcer that's ever been. His life motto was this, it's never too late. He was a drunk. Had a real 
problem with alcohol, almost to the point of losing his life. I think some of his buddies at CBS and some of the folks in the broadcasting world finally got through to him and said, something has to give. And he went and found what he was looking for in the person of Christ Jesus. And he got sober. And he was set free. And from that moment on, he went and every person he talked to he had that line, it's never too late. And that's what God is saying to the people of Israel. It's never too late. It's never too late. You haven't stumbled so as to fall beyond recovery. Not at all. That hasn't happened. But here's a part of the plan that's hard for us to really grasp. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. And if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? So, what about Israel? They have not been rejected. There is a remnant chosen by grace. And their rejection has meant salvation for the Gentiles. Let's think on that just for a few minutes. Their rejection, their fall into unbelief, their stumble over the stumbling stone, Jesus Christ himself, has meant salvation for us. We see in the book of Acts, you'll see this theme carried through, how Paul, on all of his missionary stops, went to the Jew first and then the Gentile. And almost every single time when he went to the Jew and started proclaiming that this man Jesus was crucified, he was buried, he was raised from the dead, and God has made him both, both Lord and King. The Jews rejected. The religious leaders stood up and said, No, we're not going to follow Jesus. We're not going to follow your teaching. And as a matter of fact, this talk about resurrection is a little weird. <laughs> it's really odd. And so we're not following. We're not believing. We're going to continue to seek righteousness through works of the law. And boy, he would go to the next group, and then he would go to the next group, and then he would go to the next group. And finally, at the end of Acts, he said, I'm putting you on the back burner, and I am going to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles will receive. They will believe the gospel message. They will believe and go from death to life. So, the hardening of Israel, the rejection of Israel, meant salvation for the Gentiles. And it had to be that way. There was no other way for Gentiles to be included in the mix. God's desire was always to include the entire world. God so loved the world. The promise to Abraham, through your seed, the world will be blessed. It was never meant to be just a Jewish message. It wasn't meant to be a religion for the people of Israel. It was global in scope. God always had in mind both Jew and Gentile. But what if the Jew had accepted? What if they had received Jesus as their Messiah? Gentiles would have rejected. I'm not buying into that Jewish religion. We've seen throughout history 
the hatred toward the Jew. We saw it in vividness. 3D evil in World War II with Hitler and his attack and the Holocaust. But that's been the way it has been from the beginning. They've always been despised as a people. And if this had just been a Jewish gospel, then all the world would have despised Jesus. Gentiles would have never been brought into the mix. Not because God didn't want the Gentiles in the mix, simply because the Gentiles wouldn't want to associate with a Jewish religion. So, what did God do? He temporarily hardened Israel as a people so that we, the Gentiles, could be brought in. Wow. Is that amazing? I mean, here in Texas, we have the Texas Longhorns. And there's a bitter rivalry with the Oklahoma Sooners. Now, what if Jesus was an Okie and went to the University of Oklahoma and sang the Sooner song. What's that going to mean for the Texas Longhorn fanatics? Jesus wears red. He's an Okie. Heck no, I'm not going to believe him. Well, how's Jesus the Sooner going to reach the Longhorns? If there's a temporary hardening, And the Okies kick him out and say, "Uh uh-uh, he's not one of us. Then the Longhorns are going to be a little willing to bring him in. What were the Jews saying about Jesus? Yeah, he was born of Joseph and Mary and his bloodline and his genealogy, you know, fits. He's, He's one of us, yeah, but he's not really one of us because if he was one of us and he truly was our Messiah we'd be you know the nation Rome would be kicked out Caesar would be gone we would have the king of kings and lord of lords sitting on the throne of David we would be ruling and reigning right now since that didn't happen He can't be one of us. So they kicked him out. And their kicking out of Jesus made him more appealing to us. Their transgression, their stumble, their fall into unbelief, which was not the pattern set by the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they had hearts that responded by faith. They had hearts that believed God, and God credited them with righteousness. They were part of plan plan A. They saw it. They understood the importance of it. And they jumped on the plan A bandwagon. But somewhere along the line, Jews turned plan A into plan B. And plan B had a big part of it as kicking Jesus out of the mix. Which feeds right into God's plan A. God so loved the world. I'm going to use that for the Gentiles. For the good of the Gentiles. So that The transgression of the Jew could mean riches for the Gentiles. Now, would any of us have come up with that plan? Would we have figured that out? I was talking to a guy this week and he said, 
You know, I have this little sign, God did not send a committee. For God so loved the world, he sent his son. He didn't send a committee. If we had gathered together as a committee, we'd have never come up with this plan. And salvation wouldn't have come to anyone. We'd still be dead in sin. We would still be separated from God. But God knows what he's doing. God knows how to plan. God knows how to execute a plan. And it's all bound up in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So, their rejection has meant salvation. Now, we Gentiles, we can start becoming boastful and arrogant about that. Na, 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 God loves me more. I mean, he's rejected you folks. There must be something really special about us. Nothing special about us. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not one of us thought we're seeking God. Not one of us were doing good. Not one of us had any ounce of righteousness. Not one of us could offer anything to God that he would step back and say, Wow, that amazes me. That astonishes me. Because you're such a wonderful person, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Not a one of us can say that. Yet, we can. And so, Paul gives a warning to the Gentiles. Look, you were grafted in by the grace of God. You were grafted into that same tree, the tree that started with Abraham, the promise coming to Abraham that said through your seed the world is going to be blessed. Abraham responding to that in faith. Isaac responding to it in faith. Jacob responding to it in faith. All credited as righteousness. We were grafted into that tree of faith in Jesus. It's nothing that we did. It's nothing in our character that caused that act from God on our, on our part. It was just of His choosing. So there was nothing for us to boast about. We certainly don't stand on our own. We're supported by the roots. We're supported by the trunk. That's who we Gentiles are. So don't boast about it and don't look down your nose toward Jewish people. God has a plan for them. And that plan is going to be carried out just as His plan for us has been carried out. And it's going to be marvelous when all of us stand together. The fullness of the Gentiles has come to be. The fullness of the Jews has come to be. And we stand together as one unified people of God that's his plan so there's nothing to boast about it was God's kindness that brought about our salvation if he hadn't extended kindness to us we'd still be lost we'd still be dead in sin so remember that God doesn't love you more God so loved the world so What's the conclusion? He said this, this chapter is so dense. There is so much. I mean, we could spend weeks and months and years just on chapter 11 trying to get to the fullness of it. We're not going to do that. But what is Paul driving at? What is he trying to move us to? Verse 32, for God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What do we see in Christ Jesus? We see mercy, the mercy of God being poured out on mankind it was the fulfillment of the mercy 
that was shown on the Day of Atonement as the blood was being poured out on the mercy seat. And forgiveness was extended to the people. And if anyone looked at that from the Jewish world and understood what was being communicated, then they would have been of the same faith as their father Abraham, who believed God and was credited righteousness. In that sacrificial system, there was a foreshadowing of the work of Jesus Christ. And by living in that sacrificial system and carrying those sacrifices to the altar and recognizing that the blood of those bulls and the blood of those goats and the blood of those lambs could make clean because there was another sacrifice coming that would take away sin forever, they were recognizing their need for mercy. And there was a belief in God that could be credited to them as righteousness. But they rejected. And that mercy flowed out into the Gentile world. And we don't have a problem recognizing our need for mercy. We're just a bunch of Gentile dogs, heathens, pagans, living to gratify the flesh. That's the philosophy of the Gentile world. And so when mercy from God flows our way, as it has in the person of Christ Jesus, we respond. We're not sitting here as Gentiles saying we need to work for righteousness through obedience to a set of rules and regulations. We didn't even have those. We didn't have the Ten Commandments. We didn't have any of those things. We just had our sinfulness staring us right in the face. And here God pours out mercy in Jesus and we respond. And as we take hold of the blessings of God, the promises of God, the gift of God, His Holy Spirit in us, the people of Israel look in and become envious. Why have they obtained what we have been so diligently seeking? But there's going to come a point in time where they're bound over to disobedience where they see that they too, like us, need mercy. And at that time, as it says in verse 26, all Israel will be saved. I don't know exactly what that means. Theologians have come up with all sorts of things. You know, projecting it out there to Jesus' second coming, any Jew alive, that Jesus' second coming is going to be automatically saved. I don't see how you get that from the text, but that could be. All we know is that all Israel will be saved. Those who are of the same faith as the patriarchs, the first fruits, to whom the promise was given through your seed, Jesus, the world, will be blessed and they responded so what's this plan of God it's all about mercy why because Jew and Gentile alike needed mercy no one can boast before God no one can say I am good on my own no one can say that I'm righteous apart from the righteousness of Jesus Christ we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God Every single one of us need mercy. Gentiles, we're receiving that mercy now. It's being poured out into the Gentile world. There's going to be a time when God will circle back to the people of Israel and that mercy will flow. That mercy will flow. And they'll be cleansed as all of us. That's the plan of God. 
it's an amazing plan. It's, it's such an incredible plan that all Paul could say was, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. No way we could come up with this. There's no way we could think of it, could dream of this. This is out of the mind of God. The mind of God that said, I so love the world that I've sent Jesus. Jesus is the source of mercy. Jesus is the source of forgiveness. Jesus is the source of life. Jesus is everything. We're not stumbling over him. The Jews are. But there's going to come a time where they stop dead in their tracks and they see him for who he is. And his mercy will be theirs. That's good news, isn't it? God so loved the world. And thank God he loves us. Well, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wisdom, for your knowledge that have been expressed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And there's not a single person on the planet that doesn't need your mercy. There's not a single person on the planet that doesn't need your forgiveness. There's not a single person on the planet that doesn't need your life. Thank you that you diligently work in this world to bring us all to that point where we see our need for your mercy. That you're doing that very actively and prominently in the Gentile world today, but you're also working in the Jewish world. And there's a remnant there that's being saved by grace just as Gentiles are. And we look forward today to that day when that message will be fully accepted in the Jewish world and that we can all stand together shoulder to shoulder singing your praises for the mercy that we've all received in Christ. Thank you for that. Help us to walk humbly before you recognizing that it's all of you and none of us. We thank you for this in Christ's matchless name. Amen.